You are listening to the Crazy Town Podcast Interview Anthologies Volume 3 with the interviews we did with Darren mm. Pfeiffer of Goldfinger, mm. PJ Stover, radio host, mm. voiceover actress, and DJ, or, and a uh, wrestler, and stunt woman. Got shit, all sorts of shit. Yeah, right. And then Kay Cutta, tattoo mm. artist oh. who appeared on Ink Master. Decadent. These these are some three fire interviews, man. There's some, yeah, there's, there's some, some good ones. There's some sweet and savory, some sour, a little bit of salt thrown in. Mm. Oh, it's like a fucking it's like, it's like a buffet. Fucking umami roll. Ooh, an umami roll of interviews, everybody. <laughs> All right, enjoy the show, everyone. special episode of the crazy town podcast interview anthology volume three i am your host jonas and i'm here with t and t dynamite the explosive one t and t d-i-n-o m-i-g-h-t what's going yeah. on guys we're just hanging out this is a rehash of our interviews all put in one place three great interviews on this show tnt Darren Pfeiffer of Goldfinger. Mm, like a slow roasted risotto. Yeah. <laughs> PJ Stover, stunt woman, DJ, voice over actress. A decadent crueler. <laughs> and Kay Cutta, a talented ass tattoo Ooh, artist. A from... Flame broil T bone. Yeah. Of an boy. Interview. First up, Darren Pfeiffer's interview, man. All right. One of the best. Yeah. This is probably one of my favorites yeah. from the season. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about all sorts of stuff, man. He tells us some stories about being on the road, a little beef he had with some some other rockers, fucking uh, some pranks he used to pull. We he, talk, even talk Lake Effect Snow. Yeah. He's way cooler than we are. Yeah, he really is. <laughs> he really is. So, all right, we're going to jump right into the interview, and we'll be right back to discuss here in a minute. All right, we're back on the Crazy Town Podcast. We have a very special guest on the phone today, Darren Pfeiffer, former drummer of Goldfinger, sometimes with some 41s and other bands. Welcome to the show today, man. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, and uh, where, uh, if you want to let everybody know, where can they find you online, you know, for if they want to look you up as far as anything that you have going on nowadays? Uh, well, I mean, I have got a podcast myself. It's called The Dangerous Darren Show. Uh, just go to www.thedangerousdarrenshow.com or just Google Dangerous Darren Show or find me on Twitter at DangerousD underscore show. That's also Instagram at DangerousD underscore show. So I'm not that hard to track down. Awesome. Awesome. So I, uh, I see here you're from like the Buffalo, New York area, uh, Akron, New York. We're actually from a similar area over like the border of, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania there. So I just want to ask you a quick question. What about, uh, tell these people about Lake Effect Snow. <laughs> now, you know what Lake Effect Snow is, correct? Oh, I do. I, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, see, Ohio, Ohio is a little, a little, what, where are you exactly? Are you like, are you north of the area? We're north almost, north north. We're, we're basically on the border of Pennsylvania and, uh, yeah, and Ohio. So we get Ohio. tons of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How, how how Lake Effect Snow works and why Buffalo is, has a bad rap is because the storm going uh, west to east uh, in most meteorological store uh, models will will go over Lake Erie and will pick up a shit ton. Can I swear, right? I can oh, swear? absolutely. Yeah, anything you want. Man. Okay, we'll pick we'll pick up a shit ton of of snow, and then as soon as it gets over the land, it'll just dump snow over over any available landmass, and that happens to be Buffalo, New York, which is directly uh, east of of Lake Erie. What's so as the soon most... as it goes over the lake, it gets all. I'm sorry. The most? Ahead. Yeah. What's the most you've ever seen drop in your lifetime when you lived there? There was a blizzard in 1977. It was a big blizzard. It was called the Blizzard of 77. <laughs> and it was massive. We're talking like eight feet, nine feet. It was Ooh. just, I mean, over the course of, over the course of a short, short period of time. Uh, and uh, everything was shut down. Airports, roads, uh, schools, 
I mean, it was just madness. I remember our house, we had the big tunnels to get out of the house to, even to get to the driveway. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. And uh, the, the, the state throughway was shut down. It was just utter madness. Luckily, my family had a snowmobile, so we were able to, oh, that's awesome. you know, to, 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 to get around and, uh, once the madness was done. But once it was done, there were, there were mountains of, of snow on the side of the road. Uh, so you had to dig out of the mountain to get, at least get to the road. And, and but as a kid at that time, I was um, it was eight and seventy seven, so it was uh, it was um, it was a lot of fun, you know, because there's sledding and there's snowmobiling, there's hockey everywhere, and it was just it was a blast. But I remember, you know, my dad and my my older brothers digging us out of the house so we so we could at least have oxygen. And that's exactly you, you couldn't why see I moved out, the out of New York. There was, there was so, you couldn't see just you couldn't see outside the window. They were just unless you're on the second floor. But there was there was it was nuts. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Like, yeah, we I saw probably like yeah, like three foot drop like overnight. You know, things like that. That's it's pretty crazy. So, um, I I read yeah. somewhere that you, the first band you were ever in is it had members that are now in Cannibal Corpse. Is that right? That's right. It was a, it was a band called Beyond Death, and Beyond Death was a like a thrashy metal death metal band. And we played a ton of shows around Buffalo, and uh, I was getting more and more into different. I was getting more and more into punk. I love metal, I still do, but uh, I was getting into punk, and 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 uh, I loved reggae and ska. And then the two guys in the band were just so into the, the extreme death metal stuff that the band broke up. And uh, I went on to start a hardcore band called Zero Tolerance. So I did a little, little bit of noise in the East Coast, and then the other guys went on and formed, uh, reformed just Cannibal Corpse. Yeah, that's crazy. Did you ever think of trying to get a Goldfinger Cannibal Corpse tour together back in the day? That'd be interesting. <laughs> two, those two. It would be bases. interesting, but it would just not. It would just not work. The fans would just would would kill us. It would it would be there would be homicides every night. <laughs> or each other. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and our, and our fans wouldn't go because they're afraid of dying. You know, like being assaulted <laughs> and killed. Right. 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 Exactly. Or, or, or raped and murdered or both. So it, it was. It, yeah, it wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it sounds that was, like my kind of concert. Honestly. Yeah. Right. Every, yeah. Just rape, murder, death everywhere. Yeah. So. Um, I also have seen that you have a infatuation with Wayne Gretzky. I do. Yeah, I've, I've always looked up to Wayne. I'm a big hockey fan, as you know. And uh, I just I follow the Kings in L.A. I follow the Sabres in my hometown of Buffalo. And uh, when the Sabre games weren't on in the playoffs, because they either didn't make the playoffs or they would be out in the first round, and in the hockey star of Buffalo market, they would just throw on the Oilers game because the Oilers – always made it to the playoffs and they always wanted to stand at the top and or they went deep. So it was just good programming. So I never became an Oilers fan per se, but the Gretzky, how could you not become a Gretzky fan if you watch the Oilers every day? And the, the things he was able to do with his limited speed, limited skating ability, but his, it was just, it was just a thing of beauty. And I, and I got to meet him a few times and it's, it's always a thrill when he remembers me and he heard <laughs> right. that he, he's heard the song I wrote about him and we, 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 we see each other, we have a laugh about it and, that's that's pretty uh, awesome. It's, what position? Yeah, do you he's, play? I'm just a big fan of it of, of the guy. What position do you play? Uh, well, when my, I'm a natural left winger, um, but when you play pickup hockey or shooting hockey, or even when I played in the leagues in in Toronto, uh, I was always, I, you moved around a lot. So sometimes there wasn't enough defensemen. So because I'm a good skater, they're like, you you go back there and play D, or I play center if there wasn't enough. And you, you can, if you're a hockey player, you, you can pretty much play any position that's needed. But naturally, I'm I'm a left winger. Okay. Are you, can you fight? Um, I, if I have to, but the leagues I played in, um, oh, you, there was no fighting, or you were ejected from the league. Oh. There were a few dust ups. Right. There right. were a few dust ups, a few pushings and shovings, but but nothing ever li- resulted in you know the gloves being thrown down. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I, no one ever wanted to fight me. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm six two two thirty five. So so no no one really wanted to to go at me. Right. Like that. Right. So okay. Back in the day when you were in, in Goldfinger, how big of a deal was it for you guys to get on the Tony Hawk Pro Skater game? It, for me, it, it was huge. I remember the meeting very well, and I, we were getting licensed in video games all the time, and we were getting licensed in in, uh, in, in uh, movies and TV shows all the time. We had a really good label and, and, and a good management. So it was like kind of a big deal whenever we got our song placed in something. But when this came across our table, me being the skateboard nut, nuthead, I was like, we're doing this. And they, I think they offered us 50, if I remember correctly, it was 50,000 to, to, to use Superman. Well, and I said, no, 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 no. I said, no, 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 no. This, this video game is going to be fucking huge. It's going to be a smash success. 
we absolutely positively unequivocally have to take points. We, we beg for points, beg for half a point. Right. Like, well, Darren, 50 K is it's a lot of money. That's, you know, you need this. It's a lot. Of, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, and I, I got on the table and jumped up and down and started screaming. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I was like, I don't want, we don't need the 50 K. We're doing great right now. We're touring, we're selling records. Things are going great. We don't need the money to survive and eat. Like, let's take the point. And then finally, this just shut me up. They're like, okay, fine. If the band agrees and the band was like, whatever Darren says, he's clearly passionate about this. And, <laughs> right. and we, we, we took a point and or, or half a point, whatever it was. We, I still get checks in the mail from, from that from that video game. Oh, wow. You still, to this day, from Tony Hawk, still get checks from that song. It still sells, yeah. In different parts of the world, it still sells, yeah. Now, did you ever play the game? Oh, oh, constantly. Really, what was, yeah, well, what was your what was your best combo level? <laughs> oh, I don't I don't remember. Don't remember? It, was, it was so long ago. I don't remember the numbers or the combo levels. But the, I was I played it until I finished it with yeah. each skater. We asked the hard hitting questions. Yeah, here yeah, on yeah. We get the hard hitting questions like uh, what your favorite questions. level. Yeah. Everyone was. wants to know what's your combo level. <laughs> Everyone's dying to know what. You know, some people. If I could just know, find. Go ahead. I'm sorry. If I could just find Darren Fife's combo number, I all will be right with the world. <laughs> right, right, exactly. You know, some people, yeah, playing that game, it was like the it was like the game of like everybody. Everybody was so hot on that game. That was good. I'm glad that you pressed so much to get on there like that. Yeah, that worked that worked yeah. out great. It definitely it, well, they it can, influenced Tony, my childhood. Tony was a big fan. I've had Tony on my podcast three times and we've talked about it at great length and he was like, I was a big fan of you guys. I, I remember when it came out, I heard the band, I thought it was rad, and then I heard Superman, and that was like my favorite song. And he goes, that's by far the biggest hit of that video game. Everyone loves Superman. Uh, and um, now it's, it's, it's so surreal. Like, yeah, I wanted to be part of this video game, and, and I, I wanted to take points. And, and now me and Tony Hawk exchange messages, and, and he always invites me down to San Diego to go skating with him. And it is so surreal. Um, but it, it was a big part of our, our career, really helped bring a lot of new eyes and ears on what Goldfinger was doing. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's a nice staple song in, in, in the set. And it, it, was, it was a great little run. And that video game, I played that video game so much that the band had to come get me and tell me we were going on stage in 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, had, and I haven't even changed my, my, my gear to, to play. And then the tour manager's like, Darren, we're waiting for you right now. I sometimes had to go on stage in clothes that I wasn't comfortable playing in just because I was so against the clock. You're, you're I right. no warm up and you know no yeah i didn't i played without any years a few minutes because i didn't have time to set them up and yeah it was it was a a, a drug do you still yeah. play video games now no as a matter of fact i don't and uh when i said that it was a drug that's the reason why i don't play video games because i got so much on the go between uh between punk rock karaoke and playing in the, and filling in for, for the dickies and and doing session work around town, the podcast. I work for two merch companies. I got a management company, a, a record label called High Four Recordings that I, I got a guy on right now named Ryan Sims. I'm pushing very, very, very hard. I'm working with a group of, of investors that he's got. Um, so so I, I, my time right now is vexed. So if I had a PlayStation or, or if I had a – or whatever, it, it's hot right now. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, Xbox, I suppose. Um, if I had one of those units, I would just be – in my living room playing video games until five in the morning. I would get nothing done. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's, it's crack. Co- for me, it's crack cocaine. And I know that if I, if I, if I, if I did get a system, my life would be over. Right. That when you retire, man, you got plenty of times to play, to play video games after that. So, um, I, know. I, I, I just know when I'm at some place that has a video game, if it's a party or someone's house, I'm like, Hey, you want to play uh, FIFA? Or do you want to play Madden? Or do you want to play whatever? I'm like, yeah. And, and I start, I start smoking the crack pipe. So to speak, <laughs> and, and next thing I'm like, what? You I'm like, why don't I get me one of these? And they're like, dude, you can afford it. Just go buy one. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm totally going to go to Best Buy tomorrow. And then they get in the car. I'm like, oh, I can't do it. I just can't oh, do it. Man. How many days so for that little window, <laughs> But for that little window, it's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So oh, people, a lot of people say that the drummer is the least glamorous part of the band you know everyone always goes for the lead singer or whatever yeah, it sounds like the guitars of, like, do you uh do you ever regret be- choosing yeah. drumming or like what led you to drumming over being like a guitarist or something like that uh i chose drumming because i just love the drums i think they look cool i mean i thought guitars look cool and basses look cool and stuff but i, I just think the drums with all the cymbals and the way they're all strenny and the way they look and the way that the drummer was flailing his arms around and i just i just thought it aesthetically looked cool and then I, I, I do regret it when I play shows with, with certain bands like punk rock karaoke and I have to carry my own gear. 
Uh, um, that's that's when I'm like, why don't I become a really good singer? Right. Yeah. You have nothing but like your voice, right? Exactly. You have to carry all your yeah. drums around. That makes sense. Yeah. That's when I regret it. But um, I, I just love the way they looked. I love the way they sounded. I love that a band can't really be a good band without a solid drummer. And, you know, the drummers for years were the butt of the jokes, but I think bass players have, have really sunk to the bottom. The drummers so that's, I, I agree with that. I think they've, they've definitely like sunk a little bit. The drummers come more because there's more prominent drummers like, you know, guys like you and uh, Travis Barker, people have really like, yeah. you know, like made the drummer more popular than Let, it used less to be. Less strings mean, mean smaller penis usually. <laughs> oh, is that, is that on the street? Usually. Yeah. So do you have any – story from when you were touring all these years that's so unbelievable that people if they like they just won't people probably won't even believe it but it happened um what was that uh i guess the one that just pops out right for me was uh i i almost got into a, a, a very very physical altercation with johnny Lydon from from sex pistols oh really what <laughs> We, we we were touring together, and we're touring the world, actually, like Japan, Australia, New Zealand, all over Canada, Mexico, U.S., and it was like three, four months tour with, with the, when they just got back together, and we played a thing called Bumper Shoot in, San, in, uh, in Seattle, and it was MXPX opening the show, and then uh, Goldfinger, and then, and then the Pistols, so some jackass at this soccer stadium gave out CD jewel cases as prizes, and also glass bottles are being served with with, with booze, oh, of, uh, beer. So of course the match players are getting just pounded with, with glass bottles from all these old punkers and stuff. Mm. Uh, and then everybody just you know the the punkers that go to the shows. And so the pro, the guy comes on the stage, the the radio DJ, and he goes, "Hey everybody, coming up this hot new band called Goldfinger." And then the Sex Pistols, so don't throw anything at him. <laughs> oh, so of course it's raining that? glass. It's raining glass. It's raining CDs. John gets John Feldman gets hit in the eye with the CD and stops the show and pulls the guy out and says, "You know what? You know when my mom told me not to smoke pot, all I wanted to do was smoke pot. If you tell them not to throw shit, they're gonna throw shit. So you're gonna stand right here. They're gonna take it. Go ahead, crowd." And we got out of the way, and it was like literally like this. And he took it like a, like a pro, you know, like a champ. But the Sex Pistols equipment behind us took a, a pretty heavy beating. Oh, <laughs> so. After the show, our bass player now, mind you, his name is Simon Williams, original bass player, Goldfinger. He, he was from New Zealand, so we were just getting ready to go up to Vancouver, play Vancouver, and then fly to New Zealand, like in, in, in three days. So he goes backstage. To, I wasn't there. He goes backstage to apologize to the band about anything that might have been broken. I, I, nothing was, but he said, hey, if anything is broken, we'll pay for it. We'll replace it you know, in an hour. Let us know. And you know. And then Johnny Light apparently ripped him, saying he you guys aren't punk. You guys don't know shit about punk. Fuck you little punk, you little shitheads. And you're off the fucking tour. We're kicking you off the tour tonight. And kicked him, kicked him out of, out of the dressing room. So I go into my dressing room and I, I see Simon crying. I'm like, what's up? He's like, I'm not going home. We're off the tour. We're, 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 we, we got kicked off the tour and told me the story. So I see Johnny Lydon in this like backstage complex where all these trailers are like parked in a square. And there's a little barbecue pit and there's a bunch of food and booze. And I walk right up to him and I'm like, you little, you're a piece of shit. He goes, what? And I go, I go, my bass player apologized to you, you know, about broken gear, which nothing is broken, by the way. And you had the nerve to assault him and kick us off the tour. He's like, who the fuck are you? And I go, I'm the drummer of Goldfinger. And he goes, fuck you, mate. And I go, I go, I go, I go, fuck you. We're off the tour. Let's go. I go, put your money where your mouth is, tough guy. And he goes, oh, really? And he looks at me and he's like, oh, really? And he really, he looks at me and smiles and he walks towards me. And I, and I, now, now my fists are up. I'm like, here we go. I'm going to fight Johnny Lydon. And a big 375-pound Samoan bodyguard puts his arm in between us and goes, looks at me and goes, nope. <laughs> now, nicest, sweetest guy I'll ever meet. He wouldn't harm a fly, but he could literally crush me like a grape. <laughs> and, and he's holding back He's holding back Johnny Lydon. And now Johnny's like coming at me. He's like, come on, come on. You think you're punk? You're not punk. Fuck you. And I'm like, and, I, and the guy looks at me and shakes his head and, he goes, Dan, I can't let you, I can't let you near Johnny. And I look at him and I smile. I go, you lucky little piece of shit that your bodyguard's here to stop you from getting your ass kicked by this punker. Right, and, right. And he goes, and he goes, let me out, let me out. And then now he's holding Johnny back. And I go, you shit and shit piece of shit, <laughs> fucking pussy. You're not, you're not punk at all. You're not punk. Fuck you. And, and so they separate. And me and Simon just we figured, well, John and and. Uh, Charlie were gone. We didn't know where they were. So we just said, let's get done. So we just got hammered and uh, we decided to kick in their 
floor of the dressing room and trashed their dressing room. Oh Jesus! So oh, we kicked in nice. the we, we kicked in the we kicked in the door of their dressing room. We smashed their TVs. We pissed all over their clothes. We didn't steal any money or jewelry or valuables, but we, we we turned all over their food. We put mustard on everything. We we, we fucking put holes in walls. Kicked over furniture. It was destroyed. So the next morning, we get a call from our tour manager. We're having a, a conference call in the lobby with management. So me and Simon are like, oh, fuck. We didn't tell John and Charlie what we did. We're fucked. We're in trouble. We're in a, you know, we might get charged. So we're like, oh, there's an incident last night, right? And we're like, yeah. He's like, well, you guys got kicked off the tour. You did get kicked off the tour. We got a call that, you know, you're removed from the tour. But something happened, and now you're back on the tour. Really? Maybe they respect you asking. for destroying their, their dressing room. Because that was pretty bad. That's what we, 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 we eventually told Charlie and John what happened. And they're like, you did what? We're like, dude, we were off the tour. Why wouldn't we act like assholes? Like, <laughs> fuck it. Who, who cares? So, uh, yeah, the, 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 he's like, get, get, go to Vancouver right now because you got a show tonight. So we drove to Vancouver, we played the show, then flew to uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, Japan, and uh, Asia. And, the whole time, me and Johnny Lyon had to be separated a few times. We, we saw each other in the hallway, and I look up and smile. He's like, he, he looked at me, and he goes, you think you're so fucking smart with your little fucking smile, eh, drummer guy? And I'm like, I'm right here, Johnny. I'm right here, buddy. And then security guard was never, never far away. He was always, always near the band. And the band never traveled anywhere without this guy. So, uh, and uh, the guy would come in and look at me and goes, Dan, like, as polite as can be, he goes, that's really not necessary. <laughs> like scolding me softly scolding me like Dan come on that's really not necessary I'm like yeah you're right I'm sorry and, and then as Johnny walked away I mouthed the words fuck you <laughs> just so yeah so he can see you yeah exactly <laughs> so we this happened in the hallways of the venues this happened in the airports I saw him at the airport we were at the same gate so I'd blow him kisses I'd be like <laughs> Like I'm just waiting for him to just come across the room and start fucking assaulting me because I would have destroyed him. Oh, I, Jesus. I, I, I saw him at the Apple Store in Santa Monica on the Promenade about two years ago. Wow. Okay. And I re- talk about regret. I, I regret not walking up to him and saying, "You don't remember me." But I played drums in a band called Goldfinger, and we were on the Frilly Luke tour in '97 or whatever it was, and we almost got into a fist fight. And I wonder what he would have said if you'd have said, "Ah, oh, fucking fuck it, mate. Who cares?" It was a long time ago. If you just said, "Well, my guard's not here. Do you want to finish this?" Yeah, right, right. Like all those years later, it would have been funny if you went up to him and he just knew who you were immediately. He was like, "It's you." And been, he's like, "He's like, you're the guy I never got to fight." And I'm like, "Let's do it." <laughs> <laughs> right in the Apple Store, even, fucking hey, man. Unresolved matters. Even though no, we were, we, we would have gone outside. We would have gone outside, but, but 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 by some miracle, if he if he did beat me up, I'd still get a, a shit ton of press out of it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's crazy. Does that happen a lot with different bands? Like when you're on tour, like you're around them so much and clashing personalities. Do you guys get into it with other no. bands? No, never, ever. Not once. That was the only time. Yeah. You would figure with all yeah, these different like, people that eventually someone would disagree. But I guess I guess you're all kind of in it for the same cause. You're all kind of entertaining and having a good time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be weird. I mean, there was a band called Arlen Peace. Uh, I remember them. Rock band. And uh, who, who I've since become very good friends with. Uh, but Johnny, uh, John Feldman took some shots of them from the stage and, and the singer didn't like it. Lane Maidner. His name is Lane Maidner. And he came up to John one time and was like getting into his face. And, and John's not a fighter. He's kind of a pussy. And he, and he was like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I was just in, we're in a band. We just like to say shit. And the guy's like, not much bigger than John. He's like, you do. You know what the fuck, man? I should knock your fucking teeth in. So I was right there. Nothing was going to happen. But John, John definitely had his tail between his legs at that one time and and it's funny because our lady peace whenever we did radio shows with them i I really didn't like them back then i do now uh but but back then i was like oh they're so bad i would go into their dressing room and steal all their alcohol (laughs) (laughs) and i I, and then uh and i worked at a radio station in toronto for years and i had interviewed him one time i was like oh we're here with our lady peace and you guys remember playing shows with us? I'm like, yeah, yeah, every now and again, you guys would be on the bill, a big radio show type of thing. And I'm like, do you guys remember ever going to your dressing room after the show and your alcohol was all gone? So like, yeah, you know what? That happened to us a few times. Like, that was me. <laughs> and how many years yeah. later is like, this? Oh, this is like 10 years later. And, and I was like, <laughs> hey, I'm really sorry. They're like, well, what did you do with it? I go, I go, you weren't the only one. It was you. It was I, Mother Earth. It was live. It was whole. Any band I hated. I, I would either break into the dressing room or just walk in. It, 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 I was so brazen. I had a cart. I brought in a cart 
and I would put all their wine and beer and spirits and, and any snacks that I wanted. I put it in on the cart, just wheel it right to the bus. And it, <laughs> At the end of the tour, my girlfriend had a pickup truck, and at the end of the tour, she picked me up with my uh, bags and stuff, and and literally like 40, 50 bottles of booze and like cases of beer. And Jeez. she's like, "Where is this alcohol? Is that all your alcohol?" I'm like, "Well, some of it's mine, but some of it's our lady pieces and I'm Mother Earth and Live and and some other bands I didn't like. Dish Walla, I always told Dish Walla booze. <laughs> Dish Walla's booze. <laughs> Darren, you're not making the, you're not making any friends, man. You're coming Steve, clean. And Steve, Steve and all, all, the, all the guys in Goldfinger. All the guys in Goldfinger were sober, so they didn't. They thought it was hilarious. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, okay. So, like, did you drink and stuff back then, or like, and everyone else? Oh, was yeah, sober? I did. Oh, so like, you were the no, only no, one I did. that we had, we had crew. Well, we all party. We all like like there were tons of girls, and there was music, and there was there was there's some fun fun times. So just no alcohol. Oh, oh okay. Or, or I'd be the only one drinking. Or the crew would come in and have a beer with the crew. My drum tech, or guitar tech, or tour manager. Once the night was over, we we would drink. But the band. Uh, they'd either not drink or drink Cokes or, or drink down alcoholic beer or whatever. So yeah, they're, they're sober. Huh. Wow. Interesting. I did not know that. So they, they always, you always hear stories about like girls throwing themselves at musicians and all that stuff. What's the craziest thing a male fan has ever done to you? What? Like, you know, to get an autograph or to get your attention that, you know, it, it may not, it may be embarrassing for them, but as like a male fan, has they ever done anything crazy? Well, at a, at a few at a few meet and greets we did along the way at these shows, uh, I had a couple fans. This happened a few times, two or three. A fan would be like, "Hey man, would you sign my balls?" <laughs> For real. And, and being the weirdo that I am, I'd be like, "Uh, sure, whip them out." Whip them and out. so he'd pull out, he pull his balls, and I would sign oh, my name. I was not. No. That's all. Do, you know? Do you think that they were trying to do it to call your bluff that you wouldn't do it, or do you think they legitimately wanted you to sign your his balls? Maybe, maybe both. I don't know. I still did it. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know. That's something to tell the grandkids. Like, that, yeah, that's Darren it. Pfeiffer signed my balls. Yeah, right. I guess. <laughs> I guess that's true. Uh, One guy made me take a photograph too. He's like, "Oh, can you get a picture of you and my balls?" So I'll actually <laughs> pose with his balls. <laughs> yeah, Pixar it didn't happen. I didn't touch right? him. Yeah, right. No, yeah, I no. didn't touch him. I, but they were in the picture. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Do you have a favorite city that you've ever played in, toured in, venue, anything like that? Hometown. Well, in the U.S., it seems. I mean, every band has their own like hub. Like every band has one that one city that they go to, and it's nuts. For us, it was Chicago. Oh, nice. when, every time we went to Chicago, we played two or three sold out nights at the House of Blues, and every show was just better than the next. And so, Chicago in the U.S. and in, in the U.K. It was London, or even Europe, even better than Paris or, or, or Madrid or any other places like that. Uh, and in, uh, in Asia, Tokyo, our, all our Tokyo, show, Tokyo shows are off the hook. Are the fans outside of the U.S. crazier about, like, a band than the U.S. fans, or, or do you think it's crazier here? Uh, no, definitely crazier in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in Europe, for sure. In Europe. Uh, not so much, maybe not so much in Asia. I, I, they're, they're, they're very well-behaved fans there. Uh, but in, in, in Europe uh, and the UK, they just go absolutely fucking mental from the first song to, to the last. And they don't care. And they're there right at doors. So, so there's, it's not like you walk through the crowd and you're like, oh, well, it'll fill up, I guess. It's packed right away. And they go nuts because they don't know when Goldfinger is going to be back and, or some footy one's going to come back to play again. So they just, from note one, they're just giving it. It's, 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 it's great. Well, yeah, I guess that makes sense because, yeah, in the U.S., you're always like, oh, I missed them this time, but they'll be back in a year or whatever. But, yeah, and like, yeah, in Spain, they're like, when the hell is Goldfinger or some 41 coming back to Barcelona or whatever? So that makes sense. Yeah, so, totally. Are you are you a permanent member of some 41 now or do you just kind of help them out sometimes or? Help, it's more help them out sometimes. Uh, I, I've done a handful of shows with them and, and uh, I talked to Derek and uh, early – January and he's like, "Hey man, you, you still practicing the songs?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll sit down and I got to run through them." He's like, "Yeah, we'll run through them because you know, you never know with, with our guy Frank. It's, this guy Frank Zumo who plays in the band. Uh, he he's got a million things on the go. Like he's worked plays in a lot of different bands and he's got the street drum corps thing he does. And he, so you never know when he's going to take a knee on a show and they're going to call me up and say, "Hey, want to jump in?" So oh, that's awesome. Do you have, or do you have an official band that you're playing with right now that you're putting up consistent music with or? No, not, no, not really. I'm putting music out with, I do play a lot with a band called punk rock karaoke and punk rock karaoke is a band that's been around for like 25 years or whatever. It's members of 
Bad Religion. It's Greg Hudson from Bad Religion fame and Circle Jerks and uh, Steve Soto from Adolescence, uh, Stan Lee from The Dickies, Eric Melvin from No Effects will jump in and, and play shows, and then me. And oh, awesome. we go all over the we, we go all over the world and play like 80 songs. They have a 70, 80 song list of, of, of like Dead Kennedys and Clash and you know Ramones and stuff like that, Misfits. And we don't have a singer, so we'll call people up and they'll sing and we will we play. Oh, that's awesome! I've actually I've actually heard of they do they do uh, death metal karaoke like around in different places where they have a live band. You go up and sing karaoke with a band, but you guys do that as like famous touring musicians and let other people come sing the songs. That's pretty fucking awesome. Yes, it, it's super fun because we don't have a step. The, the best part of it is there's a lot of best parts of it, but the best part of it is we don't have a singer and we all have horror stories to tell about our singers. Uh, <laughs> all of us, the singers are the worst by far. They're, they're just the worst. Uh, and we don't have a singer. So when we tour, all we do is get along and hang out and, and, and no one's being a diva or a dick or I need this, I need that. It's just everyone just firm got their feet firmly planted on the ground and and uh, it's fun. Every show is different and you, and anybody that's in a band that a, a big band like Bad Religion or Goldfinger or something will tell you a lot of the times the set is somewhat cookie cutter. You, every show is kind of the same set, the same shtick, the same click track, the same everything is all kind of lined up real nice and you know where you're gonna get when when you when you're a musician and, and there's, there's some comfort in that but also it, it, it's a little it could be a, it could be a drag so with punk rock karaoke i have no idea what's going to happen song to song let alone show to show oh it's because you have such a giant set you can play you could really pick anything out of a hat and just go with it do, do you have yeah. any single yeah, exactly. stories that you that you're willing to share Oh, punk rock karaoke horror stories? No, a, sing, a singer. So you said everybody has a singer that they've had a, a an incident with. Do you have any that you, you're willing to share? Uh, we'll have to do a whole other podcast on that. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that, that that is a that is a Pandora's box of stories that I, I really want, we'll, we'll have to get to it at another time. All right, yeah, that's, that's fair. Fine. That's fair. I know there's been a lot of turmoil. I mean, I, with, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a, I'm not in Goldfinger. I mean, and I was the last original member to to, to leave the band. Oh, actually, I was kicked out of the band. Uh, John kicked me out of the band, and then he wanted to he wanted to get together with me and management and kind of kind of figure it out. And I was like, Nah, I don't want to figure it out. I I've had enough, and uh, I quit. So I mean, suffice it to say, being in a band with a singer. They don't, I mean, they're talented people. They're great. I mean, John's a great singer. And he's a great songwriter. He's a good producer. But, but sometimes being in a band with someone like, like that can, can prove to be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've listened to some of your podcasts where you've talked about that a little bit in more depth and it sounds like it's been just a damn nightmare for years. So I definitely understand where you come from. It's a whole Pandora's box. So, um, Speaking of your podcast, what made you get into podcasting? Like, where did I know you were on the radio and stuff, but what made you like decide to go the podcast route? Yeah, I just wanted to just keep keep, keep my chop sharp and and stay focused. And if something presented itself, I'd like to either say to them, "Hey, why don't we just bring the, the podcast on to your radio station, or maybe start a new one with my with my co host uh, TS?" And and we just uh, do. I just I just like I just like doing it, and we we made. We made money on it. You know, we've had sponsors. We have fun. We can swear. We can drink. You know, we don't right. get crass. Right, right. Now, TS, he's he, is he a longtime friend of yours from from back home? Like, have you known him like forever? Yeah, I've known that guy long, uh, forever. One good, good, good pal. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, and do you still do you still host uh, the King's Corner, or is that something you used to do and is done? Or oh, I'll, oh fuck. sorry, guys. That's okay. Uh, I used to, I used to, I used to do that. I don't do that anymore. No, no. no. All right. And then, uh, you know, I just have a couple other softball questions we like to throw out to people who come on the show. If I take it, you like pizza, right? I'm sorry. I said, I throw a couple softball questions out to everybody. I take it. You like pizza, right? Pizza. Of course. Okay. If you could only order one pizza with the same two toppings on it for the rest of your life, every time you order pizza, what would it be? That's kind of like my life now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hard hitting question. Is questions. cheese a topping or not? Yeah, you get cheese automatically, so then you can choose okay, two so toppings. It would be um, onions and green peppers. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a double veggie, veggie pizza guy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So is, uh, so's TNT over there. He's a veggie pizza guy as well. And the one other thing we like to throw out there, kind of goofy, if you could create your own animal. Like make two animals mate to have an animal with logistics not being a problem. Any two, what animal would you create? 
probably a uh, a mix between a dog and a fish. So, uh, so if I took my dog to a, a party that had a pool, we could like go underwater and like swim underwater. Yeah, so it would be like a fish body with a dog head, or would it have legs? Like, how would you put it together? It would be uh, it'd be a dog head, and he'd have he, instead of paws, it'd be like fins. Wow. <laughs> this guy was, came prepared. You see how fast he put that out Like it took you two seconds to come up with that. That's awesome. So. <laughs> Well, that's cool, man. So, but yeah, I mean, thank you so much for taking time. I know, uh, I know we've been working to try to get you on for a while and everything. I know you said you got some stuff coming up, but, um, you want to tell everybody again real quick where they can find you online, find your podcast, all that. And... Yeah. Just go to Google or go to any browser and type in the dangerous Darren show. Or I think the website is the dangerous Darren show.com or, or dangerous Darren show.com and the Twitter and Instagram is at dangerous, the underscore show at dangerous, the underscore so follow us we'll follow you back the show happens on adobe radio which is it's just re- rebroadcast on iheart media every tuesday at four o'clock pacific seven o'clock eastern and uh we get some pretty big guests uh, last week or, or the last time we did a show we had i had keith sutherland on talking about country music that's uh, awesome. guest coming that's coming up this this month alone is going to be joe biafra from from uh that Kennedy same we're going to have two accomplices from the police come on uh, Daryl Hall from Daryl Hall and John Oates fame oh, is going to come Hall on talk Oates. about wow t- talk about his new his new record. Uh, City Lopper's management has expressed interest. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm getting out there and getting some pretty big names on my show. All right, you're starting to make us look bad. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but thank you so much, man. We do appreciate you taking the time to to you know talk with us today. We had had a great time with you, and if you ever want to come back on, you're more than welcome anytime, yeah, man. man. Anytime, thanks. A lot. Absolutely, man. I had a blast for sure. Right. That was fun. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. You have a good day, man. Take care. Talk soon. All right, see you. Yep. Bye. And we will be right back. On the Crazy Town Podcast. The Crazy Town Podcast. TNT. That interview with Darren was fucking awesome. Yeah. The guy's he's, awesome. He's a cool guy. Yeah, he is. He way cooler is. than us. Yeah, definitely. Way cooler than us. <laughs> way cooler definitely than way us. cooler than we are. That's so what I know. We're moving on from Darren. The next interview on this episode is interview with former stunt woman and radio host PJ Stover. Wrestler. She used to be a wrestler. Yeah, she's done a lot of stuff. She's super awesome. I really mm. enjoy her. Her interview was very informative. She gave us a lot of cool insight into like wrestling and DJing and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go ahead and get into that interview right now and we'll see you on the other side of the interview. And we are back on the Crazy Town Podcast with a very special guest PJ Stover, she is a voiceover artist and has a lot of cool other stuff she's done in her past. So why don't you go and say hello to everybody? Hi, I'm very special, huh? Wow. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) definitely. You want to go ahead and let everybody know where they can find some of your things on the interwebs, like on your website or Twitter or whatever? Uh, yeah, everywhere. Just put 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 in uh, PJ's voices, and I will come up. Or PJ Stover, PJ's Voices dot com. Okay, all right. And then you uh, <laughs> are uh, you can be hired to do any voiceover work, graphics, or uh, animation things like that as well. Yep, everything is on my website. I do over fifty voices, character voices, uh, from kids and you know old men, old ladies, everything, and oh. regular voice as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, <laughs> I know uh, you had you've done a lot of things in your past. Uh, starting off, you said that you had uh, you used to be a pro wrestler, like back in the day. Yeah, oh, I've done a lot of things in my past, just like you. You've done a lot of things in your past. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. You, you don't know half yes. the story. There. Uh, yeah, I don't think I want to know. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I started out as a professional wrestler, and I worked at um, I worked with Jim Carrey on Man on the Moon, wrestling him. You could actually see me in that one, and I did a bunch of stunt work for 25 years. Um, but yeah, I started out when I was 17 as a wrestler. Okay, and what do you uh, remember uh, the yep. name of the promotion that you worked for? You mean Screen Actors Guild? <laughs> no, the, uh, the the wrestling the wrestling promotion that you that you used oh, to yeah, yeah, for. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was AWWF, American Women Wrestling Federation. Yeah. That, in well, fact, you could look that up on IMDb and on the YouTube. You just put in AWWF, and I come up. What was your wrestling persona? What was your your name? Kit 
Kitten steal. Kitten steal. Kitten steal. Yeah, that's awesome. Yo, that's so meow. That meow, so meow. Yeah, I'm dumb. <laughs> so, uh, what made you want to try pro wrestling at such a young age? Like, what made you get into that? I kind of fell into it. Get it? No. Okay. <laughs> How do you fall All right. into wrestling? No. No, I was a gymnast when I was really young. So when I saw an ad, God, I was like 15 and I saw at 16, I saw an ad and it said, looking for wrestlers. And I went, really? But without the internet back then, it was kind of, you know, something we all did. We looked on, on papers in, in magazines and stuff to find jobs. And I went to the audition and it was sure enough a big deal. So, I mean, I've worked with, I learned back then from, top wrestling people that are in stunt world today i don't know if they're really there anymore they're kind of old now but (laughs) but yeah their names are still out there and people do know who they are so that's awesome now like i kind (laughs) of always tell people that wrestling is kind of like a live stunt show so is that kind of what sparked you to move from like wrestling into stunt work Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's The wrestling was stunt work. With all the stuff, if you were going to watch some of the wrestling today or even back then, you'd see a lot of stunts happening. Uh, people do get hurt, you know, and I did flips, front flips, back flips from the tops of the ropes, things like that. So it's all stunts involved. The mm-hmm. way you fall, the way you do a flip, the way somebody else takes you on or you lift them, it's all stunt. I mean, it's and it. I hate to say it, but it's all choreographed. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you're oh, I'm Spoiler so alert. sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Now, did you, uh, did you, did you happen to win any titles or anything during your time at the, at the wrestling promotion? It wasn't like that for the females. It was just all, you know, it, it was just all oh, okay. put together. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause, oh, back, cause back then, uh, females weren't very prominent, re- prominent in wrestling yep. as they were, are today. You know, now they have, you know, just as much time as the men sometimes. So. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever yes. Read, uh... We were part of, we had the glow girls. We were a competition with the glow girls back then. <laughs> the okay. So that, they've kind of come in, into, uh, into, you know, they kind of did that series on Netflix about the glow. Yes. Rest, so that was around the same time, but you were in a, like a rival. Yes, the, the Glow Girls were not real wrestlers. They were just pretty girls that wanted to do something. I hate to even say that because I know somebody's <laughs> going to, but it's very true. We had real stunt people, um, you know, tra- with us that were actually training us, and we had some real top of the line. They did not. They had su- they had people that you know just got up there and kind of. <laughs> God, just kind of did their finger. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. But uh, so you said you worked. Did you? Is there any big name people that you that you worked with back then? That I mean, that you people would know their name, like just by put, saying who they were. Ah, uh, yeah, Gene Labelle. Gene Labelle is a big kind of wrestler guy in Hollywood. He's been doing. Oh my God, he has a son that now is also in the stunt world. Uh, he's been doing. He did Man on the Moon, but he did. He, I can't even start with what he's done from the beginning to now. He's, I think he's 80 something years old right now. Oh, wow. And he has trained the top, I, I mean, what? I've known him for 35, 40 years. And he has been training people in the stunt world and wrestling and just an amazing guy. He has a dojo in Hollywood still to this day. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's still doing wrestling training at 80 something years yes. old? Yes. Yes, he is. Gene LaBelle wow, is amazing. Talk- <laughs> Talk about a passion for the world, right? man, for oh. that kind of that How about uh, Fabulous yep. Moolah May Young? You ever you ever meet those two ladies? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, Spice so, Williams, too. She's the one that trained, okay. helped train me. Oh, that's okay. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So did, uh, yeah. did, did, uh, so did, like, what made you leave wrestling and move into, like, doing stunts instead of staying in, like, wrestling and stuff back then? Well, it wasn't uh, really leaving it. It was uh, the people that I was working with, which, you know, Spice Williams, Gene LaBelle, they were actually going into more stunt work. Well, Gene LaBelle was already doing it, so was Spice. And that's where I started talking to people about doing stunt work because I loved the industry. I mean, I was already an actress and a singer and all that, so why not, you know, go from wrestling to stunts? And that's what I did for 25-plus years, and then radio and voices and so on and so on it's all the same oh. field so yeah right 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 and you said that you uh, i saw that you worked at knott's berry farm is that the amusement park <laughs> in california yes i worked at knott's berry farm on the wild west stunt team for two years so and what did, what kind of what kind of stunts do you do it was just one of those shows you did so many times a day yep. kind of like they yep. have it 
That was it. It was yeah. a show that you did and took lots. There's probably thousands and thousands of pictures of me out there <laughs> with my cowgirl oh, outfit. Uh, <laughs> and so what kind of – like what was that show like? Like what kind of stunts were – it was a cowboy theme show or was it a lot yeah. of different things? Or No, it was one uh, cowboy themed, you know, shooting guns, high falls – Falls, falling into water, lots of action. I mean, it was a stunt action show, so lots of action. Was, was it like? Yeah. A, did it have like a story and like everybody was yeah. like, kind of like a character? Oh, okay, I got yeah, you, so. it was a Wild West stunt show, and it was uh, the biggest thing. You know, everybody that went to Knott's to see any shows, that was the main show to go see. So, oh, awesome! Lots. So, how yeah. many times a day? How many times a day did you do the same show over and over again? <laughs> In the summertime, five, six times. Uh, <laughs> and then in, uh, when October came around, you know, for the, you know, Halloween haunt, we right. were doing a lot of shows. We would do those shows during the day. And then at night, we would do the Halloween haunt shows. And the, if you've ever been, well, you haven't, but not scary, not scary farm has the best Halloween haunt show ever. And uh, I mean, it, it, it's just amazing because they make fun of everything that happened in that year. When I was in it, it was Susan Powders and some crazy, crazy stuff back then and Forrest Gump. And then we did stunts and, you know, and kind of a little show with it. And it's usually the best show, Halloween Haunt. So you did the same show five or six times a day, five <laughs> days a week, five days a week for, yeah. for, for, two, for two years? Yeah, and I was only there two years. Some people were there 15, 20 years. <laughs> wow, wow. But it, but yep. I, mean, I guess it, it, it just becomes second nature at some point because you're doing the same stunt every day. It's like you don't even have to think about it. It's a, just kind of a kind yeah. of used to doing it. But that's the thing is you kind of have to. When you're doing stunt work, we've had a couple accidents, you know, things that were pretty major that I wouldn't even go Ooh. into. Yeah, if you don't think about it or even if you do, you could still have an accident and there's still people getting hurt. And, you know, so, yeah, you got to think about it. So, yeah, every day you just go to work and go, OK, am I ready for this? <laughs> so definitely glad you're still you're still with us because I know it's dangerous work. Yeah. Well, and then I can imagine, like, say you're doing a show like that and like what you get one new person that fills yep. in because someone leaves. And then all of a sudden there's one guy. It's his first show and everybody else has done it 30 times. And you're like, oh, God, I hope this one guy does what he's supposed to do. Yes, <laughs> it's all trust. It is so trust. That's why even they do auditions, you really have to know the people and train them well. And we had the best people training us, too. So, yeah, it, it was scary. I mean, it, you know, it's just like the stunt world now today. It, it's the exact same thing. But, you know, now you're going to a movie set and you're going to do a major stunt and you're trusting everybody around you because you know that's why the stunt uh stunt industry is very tight they use a lot of the same people all the time because it's a trust thing it's really important right right that yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah now i you did stunts for the original power rangers tv show <laughs> yes i did <laughs> what character were you yeah which which ranger did you do stunts for uh monsters i did stunts for all the monsters a lot of monsters, oh, the monsters. which monsters yeah, yeah. Which monster? Go and yeah, watch, see how many. <laughs> All of them. I'll send you some Ranger pictures. Fan. I'll send you some pictures of my outfits and things. <laughs> that, that's that's awesome. So that's I, awesome. I, I I looked it up. Yeah, I say you did you did like it said like seventeen episodes of the show. That's at least, like at least the first season, right? If not more. Yeah, I yeah. I think I did a lot more than that, but those are the ones I knew you know to write down and put in. Oh, I got. Uh, yeah, I did a lot. That was back then. <laughs> Wow, so she's a millionaire. That's awesome. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think that, why do you think I'm not doing stunt work anymore? I'm doing voiceovers only because I can't. <laughs> nah. <laughs> kind of ruined my back, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear. Yeah, I imagine eh, over time like right. now was it uh now you also did a Buffy the Vampire schlep? Buffy the Vampire Slayer show? Like I did an unaired pilot? Yep. I did a bunch of them. No, they, they didn't put everything up there. I did a whole bunch of them, too. I played a, I played a wife a couple times, and then I did a bunch of uh, background stunt stuff. So, background and stunt stuff. this is the stuff. one with, uh, this is the, the one with uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Yep. The one that, the real prominent show, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's so far long ago, but I, it seems like yesterday to me. <laughs> It's so weird. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then, of course, you said that you were in Man on the Moon, that you wrestled Jim Carrey. Yep. My name is actually at the beginning of that, which is the coolest thing in the world. When you're a stunt person, you only see your name real quick 
on this one, you get to see it coming up at the very beginning and it stops on my name and flashes. So it's kind of cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty awesome. Now, which, uh, yeah. now, is that the word they, he was wrestling the woman on the the late night talk show? Was yeah. That the, the... yeah. Yeah. That was an Andy Kaufman oh, thing. You. Yeah. Andy Kaufman, he, oh my God, I'll tell you the whole thing with Jim Carrey. He is a wonderful guy and he stayed in character for that whole thing. But we all, knew, well, not everybody knew. A lot of people thought he was such a jerk, but he really wasn't a jerk. He was being Andy Kaufman, being Jim. Ca- oh, it was crazy, but he was a great guy. <laughs> Well, you know like what's them. funny? They just actually put out a documentary yep. about that, yep. like about how he was he was so not himself, and everyone thought he was a giant asshole during the whole filming, but he was trying to be yep. Andy Kaufman for that whole method time. Actor. Yep, yeah. uh, and he wasn't really a method actor, but he, he turned into one at that. You know, he's like, I'm going to be Andy Kaufman the whole time, and he was. <laughs> so yeah, it was That's really awesome. really funny. How long, like, how long did that, were you only on the set for like a day or two for that? Or is that something where you had to stick around for other things if they needed you or? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was on the set for, I guess the first week, week and a half. And then we didn't even really work. We we're just on the set for a week. And then I came back for, I think it was like three, four days. And that one scene that we did, it's like two seconds, four seconds long, something like that. A montage of the wrestlers. You could see my face. You could see that I'm wrestling. It took couple days, 45 minutes in the ring each time with him, and yet wow. I'm in it for just a few seconds. <laughs> wow. It's just amazing uh, all, the, all the footage they shoot that they cut out of the movie. Oh, the, you know, they take yeah. the best clips or whatever. Yes, and luckily I was in those clips, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's very cool. That uh, yeah. Now, it, I saw it also you were you did stunts for the movie Swordfish with John Travolta and, and them. What oh, did, were you yep. doing in that? I did car stunts. I did a bunch of movies. I did TV movies. I did a ton of things. I mean, I couldn't even go into it. I'd have to have my resume sitting in front of me to remember everything. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. But yeah. Those... What, uh, what, like what, so what type of stunts were your favorite stunts? Did you prefer car stunts or falling stunts or like what, or what did you specialize in? Was there a certain type of stunt that you wanted to do or no it was wrestling was my specialty because i was good at it and real trained by the best but i also uh driving i love doing driving stuff stunts driving i learned from a a very amazing professional named bobby orr who i think today is still training people for stunt driving to this day so and he's up there in age as well (laughs) but i think he still does it because he used to be the only guy that could go take a truck up on two wheels and now he's trained other people, so now there's a bunch of people in the world that can actually take two, uh, take a truck up on two wheels. So it's pretty cool. That's my can favorite. You, can you take a car on two wheels? I can't. I never learned that. Oh, okay. That's a really, really, really hard thing to learn, and that's why he was one of the only people that could do it. But, no, I could do a lot of other things that you'd be amazed. <laughs> I could do circles around. Like what kind around. of car stunts would you do? Would you do, like, uh, like jumping stunts with cars, or, like, what kind of car stunts would, like have you done? I could, uh, I could drive you in, sir. I could drive in circles. I could drive very fast and do a complete 360. I could do anything you see on TV. You see that all these car stunts, these people driving, stopping fast or just barely hitting a car and making it look like you've really hit it. Things like that. Wow. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's I love it. Cool. That's it. Yep. And did you say that you, you, you taught people stunt driving a little bit? Yes, I did. I, I helped at Bobby Orr's school back in, oh, my God. That was 15, 20 years ago. But, yeah, I used to help in uh, Ventura is where his stunt school was. Uh, no, Camarillo, sorry. And I used to help with the cops. We used to, t- we used to actually teach cops how to do chases. Uh, cops from everywhere, all over every state came to his classes to learn how. So uh, I had respect of cops at the time. At first, they hated learning from a woman until they realized what I could do. And then it was kind of like, OK, well, we'll listen to you. So, yeah, the cops out there that know how to chase, they learned probably or that have been learned years ago. Learn from me. <laughs> so like basically like the tricks of the trade about how to like narrowly like maneuver traffic, things like that. Pit like, maneuvers, a- everything. Yep. Yep. Oh wow, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, so, so then after stunt stunt work, you moved into being a radio DJ. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, country radio. I did that for ten years. I was a country radio personality, I guess. Morning show, afternoon, 
you know, all the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you do, uh, were you like the DJ in between songs or did you have like a little show, like uh, like a radio show type deal? Or Yes, all of it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, awesome. I did all of that. Yeah, of that. I did morning show, which was kind of crazy. Pepper and PJ did that. Did uh Pepper afternoon drop time, and then I did, you know, country. But in past the Robles, California, there's a fair. A big gigantic fair that is like the biggest fair around. And we would have the country artists, they'd all come out and we'd get to introduce them and I'd open up for them singing, you know, being in a band and stuff. I got to open up for Toby Keith one time and Blake Shelton, which was really cool. So oh, Yeah. yeah cool. Now now are you a now are you a country music fan? Of course I am. Because I always wondered if people who work on the radio and work at a format, like, you know, say someone works at a country music station, but they don't listen to country music. They prefer listening to, like, rock, but take it because of the job, you know? Most people don't. They just take the job. But with me, I looked for, really? yeah, I looked for a radio DJ and in what I loved, which was rock and roll or country, and I found country. I did get to do hip-hop at one time, but you could tell I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it just came across like it while you're, you're like, yeah, that was that guy. Yeah. He sang a song, I guess. Yes, I, I did it for like two months in Idaho, in Boise, Idaho. And I, I was like, what the hell? Here's How that the song again. the scene in Boise, Idaho is what I'm wondering. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, the Boise, the Boise hip hop scene being very, being very big. That's crazy. Oh Main god! Of Boise. It was always the same songs over and over. I mean, the I can't remember right now some of this, uh, the girl songs, uh, the hip hop crazy. Oh, like the R and B. Yeah, yeah like the R&B same ones over and over, over and over, over and over. It's like, wait, I just heard this twenty minutes ago. <laughs> Single lady, that song was always playing. I remember it very well. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. So what was your what was your most favorite and least favorite part about doing radio DJing? My most favorite was getting to go to Nashville all the time to to uh, CRS, which was Country Radio Seminar. I got to go and see all the the stars and party with them. That was probably the best part. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the perks of that. Now, was there a, like, what didn't you like about being on the radio? Uh, I don't, I, I can't even think of what I didn't like. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's pretty sweet. Wow. So, um, and then you said it, it's, uh, it, and then you had a radio show. You said it was Pepper and PJ. Was that, that was like the morning show? <laughs> yeah, that was when I first started out. That was in the morning, and that was pretty crazy. Yeah, he liked to hear, hear himself talk. I think he still does to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so you did a radio show the first couple hours of the day, then you did drive time in the afternoon later. Yeah, b- later on. Yeah, and then I, you know, I mean that through the years, I ended up just you know doing afternoons. Those were my times because that's what I liked. <laughs> I don't. You like doing the afternoon better than or early. I don't morning? like getting up at four in the morning. Who does to go to work? It doesn't matter yeah. what you're doing. Right. <laughs> well, and you have to get up at four a.m. and then talk for three or four hours straight about yeah. all sorts of random stuff. During- yeah, after like ten <laughs> yeah. cups of coffee, and pain. then you're finally awake after the first two hours. <laughs> My God. Right, and you go, what the hell did we talk about the first two hours on the show? Yeah, Man. yeah, and you messed up a lot, but hey, that happens. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So so then what made you move into voiceovers and animation and things like that? You said you've been doing that the last couple of years? Well, actually, I've been doing voiceover for years, like 20 years, but never full time. It was only off and on. I would do little voices for, you know, little story times and things like that, and then on the radio – for 15 years, 10 years, all the commercials that people will come in to hire somebody to do, I would get to, you know, do all the voices and the commercials. And that's where it started again. I was like, wait, this I really love. And I knew I wasn't going to be doing stunt work forever. So I kind of had to get better at voices. And, you know, so now I have 50 something voices and can do them all. And yeah, I mean, it's I love it. And I don't have to go crazy and hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's always good, right? Any job you don't have to hurt yourself. Yeah. So what, is there any particular voiceover project that you've done any time in your past that stands out as like the one you did the, 
the, the one you had the most fun doing or the most prominent one that people would recognize you from? Or no, like I mean, I did Nest, Nestle cookies. I, I mean, I've done ABC commercials, uh, CBS. Just, you know, basically when you're hired back then as voiceover, uh, the only thing I haven't done Disney or movies, which animation, which is what I really am trying to do. But I... You know, all the things that you would get hired for, you'd come in and read. So I did a lot of TV commercials, uh, you know, then you hear my voice. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, you don't, you can't exactly say, okay, here's the exact ones. I could go back and listen to all of them and look for everything and write them all down. But I've done so many in the last 15 years. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. Right, right. Any, any video games? Yeah, I ha- I just did a couple video games. I there were, as far as I know, uh, when I just did them, they're brand new and they're, nobody knows about them yet, but they're like, um, oh my goodness, I wish I had that written down. Should have told me I would have wrote it down. It's a new game coming out and yeah, it's like fight games. All these popular fight games coming out. So yeah, I gotta do the voices. Ah! You know? <laughs> so, okay, yeah. gotcha. so that's pretty cool. I, I think getting into the, the gaming voiceovers is probably yes. a good industry as well because there's so many different characters. For there's gaming. a million. So, yeah, and if you can get a good one and just keep with it, then that's good. But hiring for movies for Disney type stuff or, you know, whatever else is out there, yeah. that's what my main thing is. That's what I'm trying, been trying to get seriously into. So. Well, if if anyone from Disney happens to be listening to the Crazy Town podcast, you never know. Here, here you go. All three of us are available. <laughs> yeah, all three, yeah, all three of us are definitely available for anything you need. So we have a we have a we have a couple random questions that you know we like to ask people. You know, we have on this show. Oh, no. So yeah, I take it. You, do do you eat pizza? Do you like? Pizza? I love pizza. Okay, if you could only have. The same two-topping pizza every time you order pizza from now to your rest of your life, cheese is included. What two toppings do you pick on your pizza? Canadian bacon and pineapple. The hot questions. Man, what? you're the third person to say that. <laughs> so quick. Yeah. I, didn't, I expected you to think no, about that a little bit. No, that's Jeez. my favorite. <laughs> so, right up. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, I can do that. Pineapple I went with a double bacon and a TNT over here. goes double mushroom. Ooh, yeah. Pineapple yum. doesn't belong on a pizza, though. <laughs> Pineapple doesn't belong on pizza? No. That's when you're one of those guys? I'm definitely one of those guys. I'm, I'm indifferent. Whatever. Whatever you hey, want, man. Every, a lid for every pot. Add anything on a pizza and it belongs. Add a cookie. You know, it just depends on the person. Put ketchup on it. Who knows? I saw a picture. That's <laughs> blasphemy. I, I saw a picture online where some, yesterday or two days ago where someone had put peeps on a pizza. <laughs> Like yep. Easter peeps and like melted them on. It was like a cheese pizza with like peeps <laughs> melted on it. I don't know. That's pretty gross. That's but disgusting. hey, that sounds that sounds to weird. Yeah. Own. <laughs> okay, now the next one. Right, exactly. Now the next one. If you could, if you could mix together any two animals to create a new animal where logistics isn't a, isn't a problem, and you could literally mate any two animals and create a new animal. What animal? A dog and a horse. Mix? My two favorite. A dog yeah, and a horse. Yeah, my two So, and, but, how, but, but would it be like a horse-sized dog yeah. or like a dog-sized a horse, horse? Or like how, how would dog. you? Horse-sized dog. Because we don't have that. We that we have dog-sized big? horses, but we don't have horse-sized dogs. <laughs> Do we have dog-sized horses? Yeah, I guess mini ponies and stuff are kind of, yeah, little horses. Yeah. yeah. They have little so, horses. Okay, so would it be like a, a horse body with a dog head and a horse tail? Or like? Yeah, well. Or would he you have know, the dog have, claws? Or would he have, have the horse, or the dog personality in every way. So it would be a gigantic dog, basically, that would have, you know, the horse head, maybe horse ears and the neigh. But yet it would still have the personality of a complete dog, like my lab. A gigantic lab. <laughs> and, you could, and you could saddle yes. it up and ride it, so you could just ride your lab. Yes! <laughs> that, would be, that would be pretty yes. awesome. I, I actually mixed a cheetah Ooh. and a horse together that that was my that was i just figured it would be a killing machine yep. it would be like the size of a horse but as fast as a cheetah with like claws Yay! yeah <laughs> i mixed, I mixed right. a gorilla with a butterfly because yeah. i would like an army of those to help yeah me. a gorilla with butterfly <laughs> ones, that'd be a pretty sweet animal right <laughs> That'd be scary as shit. Oh, if you saw good those big lord! Ass a flying gorilla? <laughs> Hell no! With, but he has big, beautiful monarch butterfly wings, <laughs> so he looks pretty as he's coming. Okay, that's you. comical. That's actually very comical. Yeah. 
Jesus. Like that. So, and, and one last little one. If you if you could make any animal the size of like a house cat to keep in your house, what animal would you shrink down and have living with you? Well, a monkey, but you already have monkeys shrunk down. So <laughs> I like monkeys. I like uh, monkeys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, monkeys are sweet. I think having a spider monkey run around your house would be interesting. Until yeah, until they start like... destroying things when they don't get attention. 24-hour day <laughs> attention. They're they're worse than kids. <laughs> but they would be fun. Oh, they would God. be fun. You, you've, you've had a pet monkey in the past. You make it sound like you... Uh, yeah, well, like... at Knott's Berry Farm, the animal show, I've got friends that are, you know, that train animals. So I've been around all that kind of stuff, especially the monkeys. And I like them, but I wouldn't have one. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like uh, ferrets. I think ferrets Ugh. are super cool, but then they're not they very stink. often they actually have. They like stink. Right they stink, yes. They do stink, absolutely. Yeah. So. Well, I, th- I mean, that covered pretty much everything I had. Um, do you want to tell everybody again where they can find you online? So if they want to look you, you up can or find me like at pjsvoices.com or just Google me or IMDb me, PJ Stover, or just put my name in anywhere and it comes up i would hope <laughs> but uh yeah i'm on voices.com right, right. i'm on um voice realm.com i am i yes i am on fiverr.com but my prices are not five or ten dollars so they're a lot more <laughs> gotcha yeah gotcha gotcha do you do um do you do like little like if other podcasts want to get a hold of you to help do their intros or things like that is yep. that something that you're that yep you, I'm all, uh, absolutely okay. i've done them for you I, I did them yeah, for you. Yeah. So, <laughs> absolutely. So, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, so yeah, anybody out there who needs the, any voiceover work done at all, hit her up. She's very talented. So, Aww. but we do want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by and talk. To oh, us thank bit. you for so. having me. I'm so excited. I had such a good time. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And then, uh, we will be right back on the crazy town podcast, the crazy town podcast. PJ Stover, man. Yeah. She's so talented, dude. She's so, so, so perky. Yeah. Yeah. She's awesome. I like she's that. if you guys need voiceover work done, she's she's really awesome. She has a lot of cool stuff. I mean, check her out. It's at PJ Voices. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, if you need voice work done, you can call us too. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you want a, if you want male voices, you call us. If you yeah, want yeah. female give, voice. Give them a give them a hit of the deep voice, Jonas. Ooh, be like Barry White, baby. Dude. <laughs> Like that, dude. <laughs> be be whole pod- My fucking voice would hurt by the end of it. Yeah, it's worth it. I'd be like, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Another episode. <laughs> Art hurts, man. <laughs> Art does hurt. Next up, the final interview of this episode, man. K Cutta. Talented mm. ass tattoo artist, man. Mm. This one's got a little grit in it. Yeah, but I, we'll I like touch it. Base on that after. It's got yeah. a little grit in it, yeah, but yeah. I like it. He was it. on Ink Master uh, Season 2. Mm-hmm. Talented tattoo artist, man. You go ahead and check out the interview, and we'll discuss a little bit here just in a minute. All right, and we are back now on the Crazy Town podcast with a very special guest. He is a uh, tattoo artist extraordinaire, uh, Mr. K. Cutta. Welcome to the show. K. Motherfucking Cutta. Yo, 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 yo. Fuck <laughs> Yeah. Damn, son, where'd you find this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, so uh, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody real quick where they can uh, find you online and everything uh, if they're interested in checking you out. Uh, you can check me out at um, kcutter underscore tattoos on Instagram, uh, kcutter on Facebook, needle juice tattoos on Facebook. Uh, only, look at, only look for me if you're trying to spend some money or something, man. Oh, Come over here and try to heckle me and just ride my dick for free and all that dumb shit. <laughs> right, right, right. It's right. about the business. I like that. I like um, that. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of people probably know you from Ink Master. You were on season two, one of the first seasons ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. So, so, I mean, uh, but let me let me go ahead and start here. K-Cutta, where did that, where did you, where did you get that nickname from? Oh, man, that's, there's a couple of uh, variations to that story, man, but, um, uh, it actually came from a uh, prison. Uh, out, of, out of about fourteen hundred people, it was a couple people named K. So they tend to describe you by which K. You know what I'm saying? So I was like three hundred pounds when I went to prison, and I was about uh, one hundred ninety when I got out. So I was always like exercising to 
cut up or lose a lot of weight. Uh-huh. So K K cut up. Blah 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 blah. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay. You you, yeah. you willing to talk about you willing to talk about why you ended up in the pen, man? Why they lock you up? Um, cocaine what they think guns, you did? man. You know the, the usual shit. What they think I did? Oh, I did it. It wasn't no question about it. <laughs> I did it you know. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not that guy. I was innocent. Nah, I wasn't. Okay. So, I got you. I yeah, got you. Yeah, little, 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 little drugs and guns, man. You know, typical bullshit. Got you. Know? Got you. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I, from what I understand, you, you first started tattooing around, like, when you were, like, a teenager? Like, you started teaching yourself how to mess around mm-hmm. with tattooing? Yeah. Um, about 11, 12 years old, I gave myself my first tattoo, and it was, it involved, uh, a needle, a sharpened needle and some thread and um the thread was wrapped around the bottom of part of the needle, which is a little bit of the point sticking out and you dip it in some Indian ink and you just poke a whole bunch of dots and everywhere you leave a dot, you leave a dot of ink. So the closer you get those dots you make a line. So and it's funny that um every time I get a new apprentice or whatever when I'm like a drill sergeant, I'm like, what is a tattoo? And they're like, it's a series of dots. And that's basically what a tattoo is. <laughs> so, so I always, you know, yell that out when I'm teaching or whatever. And uh, that's basically what a tattoo is, man. It was a series of dots. So the more of those dots are spread out, you know, that's what we call shading. And the, the more condensed or close you get those dots, you create a line. And that's what line work is. So well, awesome. Awesome. And now, now, you were, now you were self-taught. Did you have any sort of mentor or did you kind of teach it all yourself? Um, I, I'm self-taught, uh, but uh, along my journey, I've met people that were more experienced than me, and I've picked up gems from different people here and there. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty much self-taught, man. I'm still self-taught. I still teach myself things. So, yeah, I've never had a mentor or anything. Like, looking th- looking through your work here, man, you, you've got some talent, though. Like, were you did you Thanks, excel man. in art class and shit like that? Were you always, oh, like, man, I got, talented I, I with a pen? I can tell some crazy stories, but the best story, uh, I took uh, commercial art when I was in uh, 10th grade in high school, and basically it was part of a program where we left school and went to a vocational school, and we took classes and we learned about um, advertising and things like this, and the teacher, this is so crazy, the teacher, she would run like these little campaigns, it was almost like a competition or whatever, where we would like create a business and create logos for the business and things like this. Now, there's, there's a curse for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> this shit is real funny. So, there's one particular campaign or whatever, you know, we had to design a, uh, um, a, a hair salon or some shit like that. And the crazy shit, I came up with this, I came up with this idea and it was called Curl Up and Die. And I spelled Curl Up with a K, K-U-R, uh-huh. Curl Up and Die, D-Y-E. And I did all, did like, uh-huh. do like six to eight logos or whatever, Real shit, this is no lie. You can look it up right now. There's a salon in, like, California. This, the, the, the teacher, this woman, this bitch. She stole she your shit? Selling, she yeah. was selling my shit, man. Like, no! Shit, this, this is not a lie. This is a true fucking story, man. So, as an adult, I'm sitting in prison one day, and, um, like, watching one of these little stupid-ass shows on TV or whatever, like a fucking, uh, they, like, reface or, like, uh, reface a salon or, like, fix her up or shit or whatever. And my fucking shit pops up on TV. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? I'm like, hold up. I'm like, I designed this in school. I'm like, I did this before. It was the whole damn logo. Like, everything. It's not lying, too. It's all here. It was, <laughs> it was, it was every fucking thing, man. I said, man, I'd be dead. I, it, everything just hit me right there and I was like man this woman was selling our shit and why wouldn't she you know what I'm saying yeah. we were like 15 and 16 we were fucking kids and she was teaching us something but she was getting a little like menial or basic ass pay or whatever so but she had a bunch of talented ass kids and she would put us against each other and start these competitions and she would sell our shit Wow, that's that's true true that is true crazy. <laughs> I never told that story before. That's a real oh, shit. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Now, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I thought I heard silly. somewhere where you had said the teachers in school actually, some of them actually discouraged you from doing art and drawing and all that shit. Oh, oh hell yeah, man. Um, um, I'm from uh, Youngstown, Ohio. I mean, I'm pretty. It's not a you know a, 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 a special place or anything like that, but back then, you know, in the '80s, even early '90s, shit, some places even now. Uh, a, a child's talents aren't, you know, they aren't, they aren't, they aren't encouraged, encouraged to go in a direction that, you know, their mind leads them in. So all I wanted to do was draw. I wasn't interested in X equals Y. None of that bullshit. I was like, what the fuck is this shit? I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to make no money doing this shit. 
So I would get kicked yeah. out of school for drawing and get sent to detention for drawing and all kind of bullshit. And um, it was it became discouraging. Like I, if I'm getting in trouble for this shit, it can't be a good thing because I can't like stay in class. Like I'm getting suspended. I'm getting kicked out of school for this shit. So that was discouraging. And one particular teacher, the story that you're talking about, her name was Miss Renzi. She was a math teacher. She told me like to my face. You know what I'm saying? I'm just talking about like 11 year old kid. She was like, um, she was like, you'd never get paid for drawing. You know, this is back in the 80s or whatever. So, and, and I didn't know anybody that was like, uh, get paid to be an artist. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, damn, I guess you're right. And then a couple years later, you know, so I just said, fuck school pretty much, period. And that's when I start, you know, that's when I start fucking with the streets or thugging or whatever. Right, so, right. yeah, it was, it was, it was basically teachers that turned me to the street. But instead, if teachers or whatever or, 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 or leaders of kids would spot, be able to spot people's gifts and, like, encourage you know, that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Encourage that shit and, and send them in the right direction. You wouldn't have a lot of people or kids on the street doing the things that they're doing now. But, you know, they, they have schools that you have to pay for that shit. Or, yeah. or shit like that, it's not, it doesn't happen naturally. So, yeah, that's what happened to me. Pretty oh, much. man. Okay, let me uh, let me tell you something real quick. Me and TNT are both from North yeah. East, Northeast Ohio. I lived in Youngstown for about five years. Hey. Oh, damn. Still sorry for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm, from, I'm from Cleveland, yo, though. Yeah. Like, all oh, my I'm, life. I'm, 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 Damn, I'm from the east side of Youngstown, man. Real fucked up. Oh, the east up. side Real over... Fuck. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I lived man. on the west side, and I lived in Austintown and Boardman at different points that I lived there, so... Oh, yeah, you was a spoiled fuck, man. You was a spoiled <laughs> fuck. Oh, I, I was adult, man. I lived on the north side, too, over by... Uh, <laughs> God, over by I came over by Young over by Youngstown State and shit. Like I was in, I was in oh, my college. Yeah. You, you have any? You have you have any Bellaria pizza when it was over there on uh, Logan Avenue? Yeah, I had Bellaria. And we had uh, we used Man. to. Go, did you ever go to? Did you ever go to Petra up over by the park on? Uh, God, what fucking road was that? It was this little Wick Avenue. Yeah, Wick Avenue, Fifth <laughs> you, Avenue. Yeah. 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 Do, do, do you know Petra? Wow. Oh shit, dude, Please. that place was crazy. None. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah. Small world, uh -huh. dude. Small world. So, yeah, man. So do you think, like, you know, that was kind of like a turning point? Like, you know, like you said the teachers were discouraging you from school, and you said you started being on the streets. Will that, like, be a major turning point, like, where you took that path other than, like, an academic path? Definitely, man. Um, I would say um, early 90s, um, a couple gangster movies came out. I was just on that, um, just on that brink of, like, what the fuck I'm going to do with myself. I was a teenager. And uh, actually, the movie Minister Society is what turned me out, man. That's that shit. Okay. I was like, damn, this is, I, 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 this is what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? I want to, I want to be on the street, uh, slapping people with pistols and shit. That's you know, this is what happened. I, I felt like, I felt like I school. Do that, man. Yeah, I mean, I felt like school just wasn't. You know, it, it, I didn't have anything in school that really um enticed me. You know, I didn't. I never saw myself going to college and all shit like that. Um. I didn't even know who the fuck a guidance counselor was. I mean, we had guidance counselors when I was in school, but I didn't know who the fuck they was. You know, the school was just fucked up when I was. When oh I was yeah, young, man, man, absolutely. Just, you know, yeah, yeah. You know. So I saw, I saw, like in a thing you had talked about um, that when you were in prison, like right before you got out, that your your sister and you had like an argument, and she said something to you that kind of changed your mindset of like how to move forward in life and everything. Yeah, still to this day, man, I never forget that we was just. Going back and forth in the discussion, and her, her, basically her, her, her words were, "You put yourself in a position where you can't do anything for anybody." And I was like, "Damn, that's one of the illest, <laughs> that's one of the illest shits anybody ever said to me." Because it was kind of the truth, but I, I, I was like, you know what? In, in the back of my mind, I was like, "I'm gonna reverse that shit." I'm like, "I'm not gonna accept that shit." Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna do something about that. So even still to this day, like, I just got an email from, like, a kid in Germany or some shit. I mentor kids, like, via email or social media or video chat with them and things like that. I was like, if nothing at all, somebody, someone is going to be able to say, you know what, because of K, you know, I was able to – because nobody did that for me, and I know it would have made a difference. So – you know, I, I make sure I do that whenever I can. Right, right. I saw, like, I saw you had some videos and stuff where you were talking to, like, uh, middle school, high school kids about entrepreneurship and everything like that. And right, you, And you right, had said it's right. good to catch them at that age because that's a good, it's like a turning yep. point where, if, you know, if they don't have anyone, yep. they may take the path you led and, you know, not. Exactly. So that's very exactly. awesome, man. That's very awesome that you came out to do that. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they go to prison, they come out, and they do whatever, but it's good that you've taken, taken under your wing to help kids out and make them see that there is, they have potential. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they need to hear it. You know, nobody told me. And um, it's not really anything that I, like, um, set aside to do. It's just something that everybody should do in their, um, <clears throat> in their natural walk of life, man. You know, people that look up to you. And you never know whose life you could change, man, by just a couple a couple positive words, man. You take five minutes out of your day. You can change somebody's whole world, you know? Yeah, I'm loving the positivity, man. You, you say you teach people the tattoos as well? I just got two new apprentices. My first apprentice, she's now a, a pretty successful tattoo artist now. She um, really? she sets her own boundaries, but she could do everything that I could do if she wanted to. But I just got two new apprentices. And, um, yeah, man, I mean, it's not like I go around um, teaching people to tattoo, but as a business owner and a tattoo artist, I mean, you have to build your team that way. I mean, you, you, you set your own um, – you set your own uh, – the way you make money by – either taking somebody in or taking somebody who doesn't know how to tattoo and teach them how to tattoo. So, yeah, I, I often find myself in a position where I have to take talented young people and, um, you know, teach them to do what I do. You're not, you're not fucking any apprentices, are you? Nah, I never have, but I, I no? have a couple clients, though. I, <laughs> I, a couple clients. I, I mean, it happens, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, tattooing is an intimate – I tell people all the time, man, tattooing is an intimate – very, very, very intimate situation, and if you get – matter of fact, hell, damn, two two or three of my kids' moms were, were started off a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I couldn't, I couldn't even sit up here and act like, you know, that doesn't happen because it happens. You know? yeah, right, right. It right. does happen. Yeah. Now, you you specialize in photorealism color, correct? Um, photorealism, black and gray. Black yeah. and gray. All right. Now, that's yeah. that's something that, like, a lot of people struggle with. You know what I mean? Just in general. Why do you think that, I mean, is that something you've always been able to do, like, portraits when you can draw and all that? Or is that something you've built up over the years? Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's something about, you know, only only certain people I ask can really do it. Um, and I'm, I'm not the best in the world at it, but I do it fairly well. And basically what it is is that, uh... You have to you have to trust your eye. You know you have to tattoo what you see. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but you have to follow the shapes. You have to look at the shapes of things and just tattoo what you see. And a funny story about that is when I first started tattooing, um, once I got my keys to the first shop I was working in, you know they would leave and leave me there, and I understood my boundaries or whatever. And they was like, now you know what to do. What did blah, blah, it was talked about? You know, don't do a portrait, blah blah blah. Well, I was probably about six seven months in. And one day a portrait walks in, and I was like, you know what? This is either sink or sell from here. Or <laughs> I did that motherfucking portrait, man. Blew that shit out of the water. And from there on, I mean, you know, they didn't, I didn't have any more boundaries anymore. They just said any more restraints. But if I would have fucked that portrait up, I probably would have got fired. So, right, right. You know, right. That's, well, that's, man, that's you, know, you really do sometimes got to just go big or go home, right? It's like you take your chance right, and you sink exactly. or swim. Exactly, exactly. So, so, all right. So let's, yeah. let's, get, let's get into Ink Master a little bit. That's something that people know you from. If you had to describe the Ink Master experience in just a couple words, what would it, what would it be? Man, that's some bullshit. That's, that's, that would, that's what I would say. <laughs> and that's what I that's thought what you I might say, say about it, man. Like, so. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, no reality TV anymore is reality TV. You understand what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. I always tell people it was All something scripted, cool. Man. It was something cool to do at the time. Oh, yeah, script it. Script it as you go. Um. It was something cool to do at the time. I don't regret doing it. I'm sure some people that were on my season regret doing it because some people really basically lost their whole career. Like they made a fool out of themselves or whatever. Um, it didn't work out for everybody. Um, some people lost their jobs, lost their shops because, you know, we don't get paid for doing that shit. I mean, we got paid like no maybe. Bag? Wow. Nah, man, ain't no bag. No, nah, no bag in that shit. You get paid like maybe two fifty a week. So you now, only you got money make, if you, you know, won. That was it. Yeah, you only got the big money if you won. But um, as far as being there, you left a job that you were maybe making a thousand, two thousand, three thousand a week, and you went to making two fifty a week. And if you were there for a month, that was all. you was it. You blew everything you had. You know what I'm saying? Just being there. Right. Right. So um, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, but it was it, 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 it yeah yeah it was some bullshit. And I actually. I was supposed to be on season this season nine that um, came, but it it just didn't work out. The paperwork didn't really work out. They wasn't really paying shit. They was trying to give me like a thousand dollars an episode, which would have been cool. And this is for the, 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 the shop wars or the master shop episode. Yeah, the sh- yeah, exactly the shot wars, and it would have been good advertisement. 
for my shop, Needle Juice Tattoos in Fayetteville, North Carolina, by the way. <laughs> and um, it, it would have been good for the guy that I was going to take on there with me. He's not a guy that I work with currently at my shop, but he's a guy that I've worked with before. So it would have been good. For both of us, but you know, it's and just see, work I out. kind of figured that that, that I, I I'm watching some of the see. It doesn't seem like these people work in the same shop together. So I I was I, nah, I thought they don't. yeah, they that's don't. what I thought. Like it was like these two guys didn't even know each other before. And now they work together in a shop that doesn't make any sense. Right, right, so. right. I mean, you know, you take you take something man. you take something that um in the first couple seasons might had a dynamic. You know, what a lot of people don't know is I was casted to. Uh, remake Al, Al Flick. Everybody remember Al Flick from season one. I was yeah. basically cast as the bad guy, the black guy, the you know the the, the hard body, uh, you know asshole. I was casted to replace Al Fliction, but with me, it went so far that every season after that, they've been trying to replace me, right. and you just keep getting people who to so get to the point where they're trying to act like me. They're not really, you know, they're, they don't look as good, you know. They're just not as cool or whatever, so it starts getting corny. So by the time you get to season six to seven, now you just got people that are deliberately like, okay, yeah, yeah I'm going to be Kid Cut or I'm going to be crazy like Sarah or right, they get right. the fix and they're supposed to be Tattoo Baby or, you know what I'm saying? So it just get real corny. Right. And then you get the clinical little corny white dude and then you get the cat. Well, okay, what I liked so. about uh, your season and the early seasons, they didn't focus on the house drama much. It was mo- it was mainly about the tattooing, and now it's like right. half tattooing, half house drama. So it's like right. I pretty much, and it's not not take credit for whatever. It was really just like a well, you know, they sent us to a psychiatrist before we start filming, so they basically know who's not going to get along with who. But uh, don't get it twisted. We were all cool. Like when the when the cameras went down, we were drinking. Chilling, like it was a cool house where nobody was fighting or there wasn't really a lot of drama, but as the cameras rolled, they knew who to sit next to who because it would create a certain kind of drama. Like they knew that you put, you put me, Steve, and Sarah in the same room, we're going to start an argument. <laughs> right, right. Because, you know, and then, and then, and then, and then once you edit it down, you're going to be able to make me look like the asshole. You're going to be able to make Sarah cry. I mean, it's just, it just, it was a natural drama, but now you have people that go into these situations aiming to be these characters that they keep trying to recreate. You understand? Right, right, right. absolutely. Right. It's crazy that they're so devious, yeah, man. They man, tend not... to a psychiatrist so they know how now, to get a well, rise a lot, of, a lot of people don't know, like, when, 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 reality, when reality TV started, with, like MTV and all that, what they used to do yeah. is they would set a camera up and they would run the camera 24 hours a day. Yeah. Now, and they would, and they would catch whatever they could catch. What they do now is they run the camera about 11, 12 hours a day, and they script what they want, and they hire the attitudes that they want. Back then, they would just be like, damn, we sure hope something happens. Right. You know what I'm saying? But now it's like a, it's a million-dollar production now. They have to make sure right. they get yeah. what they want because you don't want to – you're not going to film a million-dollar show, and you, your show ain't got shit going on in it. Right. They you put people so in make... situations that will cause drama right. and hope they act out and be right. crazy or whatever. Right. Right. It's so crazy because I was telling my man, I was like, man, you know what? I was like, I think I might have flunked the psych um, evaluation this time. And this, this, is, this is a real story. This is a exclusive story right here. Awesome. Because they sent me to a psych. Even though I've been on the show before, I still had to do all the shit over again, right? So they sent me to the psych, and, and um, the, the lady doctor was like, um, what would you do if – uh, what the little fucker is, or whatever one of the judges is like. They got, they got in your face, or whatever. And I looked, I was like, what the? I was like, what? I was like, what you think I'm doing? <laughs> right. There was a part of my season where, um, and if you go and people can go back and watch whoever's listening. There was a part where Oliver, the little little dude with the toothpick, he got yeah. up out of his seat and started to advance my way. Man, I was gonna sling Oliver so many directions and slam his little body in so many places, like. You, I'm the type of person where I can stand there and act cool as long as you run in your mouth. But if you make any advancements toward me in any type of uh, manner, like if I touch me, you you will fuck around and get hurt, like you real real bad. Yourself. And I, it was just one of them. Yeah, and it was just one of them days where I was on oh, one. I think I was a little too honest in my uh my psyche valve. <laughs> right, right. This time around, so she was probably like, y'all uh y'all might not want to uh put this crazy mom. 
<laughs> and I had a couple. I had a couple cases. I done caught a couple cases. Gotcha. Then, so gotcha. They probably, you know, they probably did their math and was like, yeah, we might not want to fuck with Karen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, how does that show work? Like, how often are you doing the flash challenges and the elimination? Is it daily, weekly? Like, how does that work? Man, that shit is, uh, it takes two days to make one show. Okay. So we got to put on the same fucking, we got to put on the same fucking stanky ass clothes, all that shit. <laughs> Whoa, to make it seem like, yeah, to make it seem like it's happening in one day. But in reality, we have to have our hair the same. We have to put on the same clothes. Um, we can't change anything about ourselves because it, it fucks up the continuity right, of the right. recording. But it takes it it takes two days to make one one episode. Okay. Of Game is it just back to back to back, or is there days off in between? Nah, it really. I mean, um, every now and then, like a holiday might land, and you know, we might get a day off or whatever. But like, nah, it's pretty much. And back to back to back to back. So like the that. stress yeah. people feel is real because it's like it's stacked day after day after right. day. Right. If you if you look if you, if you look you can see eye bags on the slides because we be tattooing at six in the morning. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I was like, man, none of us. I was like, none of us do this shit in real life. You know what I'm saying? Like, none of us wake up at six in the morning and start tattooing and shit. Why, why do they like, do that to y'all, man? Why would they do that to the man? People? It's 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 a, it's, a, it's a production thing, man. It's it's a production. We'd be at a party until 2, 3 in the morning. They wake us right back at 6, 7 o'clock. we sleeping on twin beds like little bitches and shit, man. It's just crazy, man. It's now, some crazy shit. Now, man. from being on that show, can you say you got, like, a like a bump in, like, business and, like, notoriety and things from that? Or did it really not make a huge difference? <clears throat> That's a good question, man. I would say it has its pluses and minuses because I've, I've made a lot. I got a lot of enemies from it. I've been blackballed in certain situations from it. Um, people form their opinions from it and, like, really don't like me in real life, not realizing that that shit is TV. Right. And a lot of that shit is edited. And, I mean, it, it's put me in situations and it's, it's kept me out of situations. So, I don't know, man. I mean, but what I always tell people, I was uh, I was making about $80,000 a year before the show. You know what I'm saying? I was doing pretty good. So, right. who knows? I probably would. I probably still be good. I would actually, you know, in my own hometown, I would probably, I would probably be better off if I hadn't did Ain't Master. Right. Oh wow. And, that's, and that right. sounds crazy. That's say that sounds crazy, but I'm being real with you. I'd probably be more financially. I'd probably be better off if I hadn't have done it because you know, um, being on TV, man, it makes people really fucking hate you, man. Like your yeah. own people in your city, they 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 envy you and. Yo, yo, your colleagues, people that you work with, like, it's hard for me to find artists to work with because good artists are like, they feel, they feel insecure around me because when the door opens, nine times out of ten, somebody's coming to see me because of, you know, Ink Master or whatever. So people don't want to work with me because they don't want to be overshadowed. Right. So now that I'm an owner, now that I'm an owner, I have to create artists. The artists that are already good, they don't want to work with me. Right. Because now they're 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 just a guy that works in K Cutter shop, even if I don't own the shop. You know what I'm saying? So it's, right. it's, it's, it's fucked up, man. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. It's, 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 it's funky, man. Yeah, it's and funky. you don't think about that funky. side of it. Yeah, people just hate because you're on TV. They and then, yeah, like you said, they feel intimidated by working with you and everything like like that. That's right. that's crazy. Now, right. Now right. you went they back. Re- they don't realize. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, anyway. oh I was gonna say you went back on the show as a human canvas and were tattooed by was it, it was yeah. Craig Foster, right? Yeah, I was tattooed by Craig. Cool guy, man. Cool yeah, he, he's, I mean, he seems all right from the show. I mean, obviously, I don't know him in person, but but you got – it was a tattoo of a lady sitting on a chair with a tattoo gun between her legs. And I remember, uh, That's my child's mom, actually. Oh, I'm picking her up right now. Oh, actually, are you? Yeah, that's my child's mom. <laughs> that's not, now, yeah. now, was that your idea or his idea or a combo or – That was that was my idea, but, you know, um, <clears throat> uh. A white guy's vision of beauty sometimes and a black guy's vision of beauty is never, <laughs> you know, it's never the same. It's never the same thing sometimes, you know. Number yeah. one, uh, what's his face? I forgot the dude's name. The, the middle dude, the dude that don't tattoo at all. Oh, Dave Navarro? He, he likes Dave Navarro. Cool dude. I have nothing against Dave, but Dave likes boys. And, um. That's, I mean, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just being real. And, yeah. um, I, Oliver pretty much like boys too, or women that act like boys. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and the other dude, yeah. he just, he just, Yo, the other the dude is just Chris, Chris, Chris just, Chris, Chris, Chris is, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't really like Chris. 
Um, <laughs> they just we 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 would never agree on anything any fucking way. I remember one time uh, we had a it was an episode I was on. Um, it was about the um, traditional shit, right? And right. Um, a lot of people like fucked up or botched the flag or whatever, like the tattoo flag. It's not a real flag because the real flag has too many details in it for you to really be able to tattoo fifty stars and all that shit or whatever. Yeah. So during that challenge, that 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 episode took three days to do. Um, when we went down to be judged. On our off time, we went online and looked up Oliver and Chris's work. And Oliver did some of the same shit that the people on the show fucked up and did. He had the red touching the blue, all that shit. And so what people did was they printed off shit and had shit in their pockets. And they was going what they what they thought it was. Now, now mind you, we, we got microphones on 24 hours a day. So right. these motherfuckers are talking about what they're going to do. And they, 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 they're going to ambush Oliver. How the fuck are they listening to you? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? These are like America's dumbest criminals. The people I was on the show. <laughs> they're talking about how they go. They're talking about how they go ambush Oliver. They go Oliver. They gonna pull the stuff out of their pocket. Like, well, you did it, and you're talking about me. Blah blah blah. So what happened was when we went down to be judged, they cut off all the cameras and they said, "Take everything out your pockets." Oh right. shit! Right. They took <laughs> out. Yeah, they made everybody take all the shit out their pockets, and it was like, look, we can sit here and waste time. It was like, y'all already know, we're not going to show none of the shit y'all do. Basically what they were saying, you're not going to discredit our judges and make our judges look stupid. Well, right. I mean, so that whole, yeah. that, that whole episode was complete bullshit because Oliver fucked up that same shit that he was judging people on numerous times. It was like three right. people that had pictures in their pockets of him doing the shit. That just goes to show you how much bullshit the show is. But like I said, man, it was a good experience. Awesome. And, um, you know. Well, Whatever. thanks for being yeah, thanks for being Ace, candid with us about it, man. I appreciate Ace, that. Dave Navarro didn't hit on you, did he, brother? Nah, man. Dave knew I would have knocked this motherfucking ass. Fuck out, man. <laughs> I've never had that problem. And it's crazy because, you know, I did nine years in prison. And people always ask, you know, and sometimes they ask kind of shy. They be like, you know, while you was locked up, uh, did you? Uh, oh. Oh, I was like, look, man. I was like, look, check this out. That doesn't really happen to uh straight guys or whatever because there's so many fags so I'm, I'm I'm sorry if, if, if any reason why y'all, if anybody takes that as like a derogatory term that's what I that's what I say gay or I don't know what the fuck the correct term to fucking say is shit, shit is always changing every fucking day everybody's a sense about shit it's fine, but um, it's so many it's so many gay people that straight people don't get disrespected or nobody's in there getting raped really yeah. unless you want like a, a high level you know like a real secure yard or like some real violent shit but nobody's in there getting nothing taken or nobody's getting disrespected because there's so many gay people that's willingly doing it. They don't have to. They don't have to find a straight dude to try to, you know, uh, turn on I got so, so like so. There's plenty of people yeah. willing to participate. They don't need to like take right. it. Right. So yeah. Sense. So so basically, the only time me and Dave really had any conversation, I also went back on um, a special called uh, Ink Masters most uh, most infamous or some shit like that. And I had an interview. I had like a one on one interview with Dave. And that was really the only time me and Dave ever talked. And we was both like, damn, man. And he was a cool dude. And he, and he talked to me and said, was like, damn, man, I, never, I didn't really get to know you while you was on the show because, like, I wasn't, I'm just not a dick riding type dude. Like, I'm not going to be, like, when the cameras was off, I'm not going to be trying to hang with people and yeah. trying to talk to them and shit. I didn't give a fuck about all that shit. Right. I was like, man, look, I was too, I was too busy. Oh, man, I fucked two producers too. But that's a whole nother <laughs> I was going to ask you if you <laughs> fucked anybody on set, man. You know? Oh, yeah, man. Oh, man, I fucked two badass producers, bro. <laughs> They got these people that are basically go get you whatever you want. Like, listen, we, did, we didn't get paid, but we had so many perks. Like, we was, like, real famous and shit. I could send them to the liquor store. I was, so, basically, what I did in my off time was get drunk. I was like, man, look, go to the liquor store. I want some Ciroc. And I want some Red Bull. And they used, to, they used to stay feeding me Red Bull because I get tired, like, real easy when I'm bored. Uh -huh. So, they would pump me with Red Bull and alcohol. Oh, to awesome. get like you know what they what they wanted to get out of me they want it was like hey we need your energy we need your energy today I'm like man go to the liquor store man you know what to get me man <laughs> hurry up That's man, awesome. hurry the fuck up now do you talk to any of the people from your season anymore or any like would you say any of them have become a friend to you or are they just all people you know now um I still talk every now and then to Mark uh, me and Jesse are pretty cool. Me and Lalo are really cool. I went to stay with Lalo in Brooklyn oh, cool. a little while ago, and I, I, I tattooed at Lalo's shop. Um, me and Tattoo Baby are cool. We don't really talk like that, but we, we, we communicate a little bit on social media. Awesome. Uh, little, little, little Mike is cool with me. Um, 
damn, what's the dude from Florida that hurt his back that had to go home? I forgot his name. Yeah, Man, him are cool. Oh my, I, I met I, I met a family member. I met a cousin. Um, damn, what the fuck was his name? <laughs> wow. <laughs> we had the same last. We had the same last thing though. But he do that weird shit like Jesse do. He he, he got that weird 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 ass style and shit. Oh yeah. Man, yeah. Him, me, me, him, yeah, yeah. Me and him are cool. I mean. Everybody was pretty cool. Only person I have not had any contact with is Steve, and Clint. Uh, may, may God bless the dead. His back of the ass. Yeah. He, he dead. He died of cancer. <laughs> shit. We, we was we was okay, but he was a snake in the grass. He he the type of person that would be cool with you and then talk about you behind your back. I got and shit you. like that. I got you. But, that um, yeah, yeah, that yeah, that type of shit. But um, I mean, everybody when we see each other, everything is all good. I see Sarah every now and then at um conventions. Sometime and she's all right, you know. Sarah, Sarah's not who you would think she is from the show. She's cool. Oh, really? So she's not nearly as like high strung and like. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. What really? What was basically going on with the show? Sarah didn't have any social skills. Sarah was a uh, uh, homeschooled. She was homeschooled and she was the only child. Uh, so okay. she was like she was, yeah she was like per, she was like perfect for social destruction. You know, that's, that's basically why they cast her. You know, I got basically. you. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Well, yeah. we got a couple random questions we ask people that come on the show, so we're going to ask you two. Uh, the first one, if you, do you, you like pizza, I take it, right? Like everybody likes pizza. Yeah, I love pizza. Right? Okay. If I you could only pizza. have one pizza for the rest of your life with two toppings, every time you ordered it had to be two toppings, what two toppings do you pick? Oh, man, um, hamburger and extra cheese. All right, hamburger. I respect that. I respect that. I respect that. All right, and then the one other one we asked too: if you could t- combo two animals together, with the logistics of it happening not being an issue, what w- what two animals would you what pick? For example, I picked a cheetah and a horse to call it like a horse or a che- a horse or a heetah, and d- <laughs> dynamite. Oh, man. And dynamite picked the uh, <laughs> the dog from Neverending Story and a what, a fucking lizard or what the hell was I don't even remember. I wanted oh, to make wow. a dragon, so I was thinking I could mix a lizard with the flying. Do- it's not important. I, I ch- my good answer was a gorilla with butterfly wings because I feel like I could take over the world with flying. Okay. Like, yeah, like a gang of the motherfuckers. I, w- <laughs> I would I would probably say a uh, 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 American bully and an alligator, a bully gator. Oh shit! Oh, there we go. So would, would, so would it be would, would, yeah, would, would it be would, the would, bulldog that. head on the alligator body, or like how would you how would you put it together? Um, yeah, it, I, I would have had an American bully legs and head with the alligator rough scales and long tail. Oh, I'm like be low <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. think I think that's a yeah. quality quality answer, man. So I guess. uh yeah. Like one last question I have for you. It, you know, have you ever done a tattoo and got done and went, oh shit, I fucked that up? Um, nah, I wouldn't say that, but there, there are tattoos that I wouldn't um take a picture of because I just, I let the client get their way. You know oh, okay, I got you. Take my, yeah, they didn't take my professional advice, they wanted it their way, and just because it's a business at the end of the day, I take their money and give them what they right. want. And they're like, you want to take a picture? I'm like, nah. Cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were happy with it, but you weren't happy with it. They loved it, and I was like, fuck that. I don't even know who I know I did this shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know my what? name on that. <laughs> but like you said, at the end of the day, man, as long as they're happy, they'll tell people to come see you. Right, exactly. It's a business at the end of the day, man. Sweet, sweet. Well, I uh, want to thank you so much for coming on, man, taking time out of your day. We really appreciated you coming on. Do you want to tell everybody where to find you one more time online in your shop and everything um, like that? Yeah, the shop is located in Fayetteville, North Carolina. It's called Needle Juice Tattoos, 512 South Raleigh Road, 28314. The phone number 910-527-7800. You can even find me on Instagram, kcutter underscore tattoos on Instagram, kcutter on Facebook. Needle Juice Tattoos also on Facebook. Cool. Yes, sir. Yo. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And, yeah, uh, and you have a good day, man. Okay. All right. Have a good All right. Take care, man. And we'll be right back on the Crazy Town Podcast. The Crazy Town Podcast. Cake Hutta, man. Yeah. Yeah. That hot take about Ink Master was like, woo! Yeah, that was that was a flame broiled steak of an interview. I yeah, think. dude. Yeah. I like talking to him. That was a good one, man. Mm. Sink <laughs> Get, your teeth into that. Salivating over right Sink now. your teeth into that one. Man. That is all the time, though, we have for this episode of TNT. All right. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash crazytownpodcast. Or shit. 
God, man, I'm fucking <laughs> my own words, guys. Twitch.tv slash Crazy Town Media. All of our podcasts, that's what I was trying to get to, TNT, will be on there live moving forward, season three. Crazy Town Media on YouTube, our channel with all of our gaming videos, podcasts, and everything else under the Crazy Town Media umbrella. And Twitter at Crazy Town Media. Never miss any news. You don't want to miss it, because if you miss it, it's gone. <laughs> that's that's the truest thing you've ever said. <laughs> all right, guys. That is all the time for Jonas for TNT Dynamite. We are out. over.